first video for Unit 3 land-based empires. And keep in mind that the time frame of this particular unit is circa 1450 to 1750. That's why we're splitting the gap between the two main land-based Chinese empires, the two dynasties of this time frame. So we begin by re-examining the Ming, and we first saw the Ming as it referred to Zheng Ha and his voyages. Now the revolt that kicked off the Ming dynasty was led by Ming Taizu, a peasant. And this peasant called his dynasty Ming, which translates to bright or light. Now remember that the Yuan dynasty has been in control of China. So the Mongols are expelled. And this is a return to ethnic Chinese rule. Initially, he suspended the civil service exams because he was suspicious of Confucian ideals, but he soon reinstated them because staffing the bureaucracy was difficult. And this led to a renewed emphasis on the importance of Confucianism among the educated elite. And this is going to remain throughout the rest of the Ming and subsequent Qing dynasty. So for another oh, 650 years or so, Social relationships were reflected in this emphasis, as the emperor again was placed at the top. All subjects need to blindly obey the emperor, who in return would model good behavior that was in the best interest of his subjects. Men of similar age and status were the only equals, while all other relationships were to be considered you know, dominant subordinates. So here we find a continuity within Chinese society with these Confucian relationships. Economically, the first Ming emperor ordered a complete survey of all land and wanted to record how much was owned by each household. And this was the first such survey to be completed since the Tang Dynasty. Each household was supposed to commit a fixed number of days to a specific type of labor each year, albeit military, mining, or farming. So we can definitely see similarities to the Mita system that the Inga used. To accommodate this and to commit to the level of efficiency required of the bureaucracy at the local, county, and imperial levels, the Ming needed an efficient system of tax collection. As opposed to previous methods like collecting taxes using farm goods, in 1571, the Ming decided to use hard currency specifically silver, for the purpose of tax collection. This created a massive global demand for silver, and although some of it came from Japan, most of it was mined and transported from the Western Hemisphere. Spanish silver is really going to play a huge role, serving as one of the first universal currencies, and Ming policy is going to help drive up its demand and usage. Now another continuity we see with the Ming is this focus that they had on northern barbarians. The Mongols just got kicked out. The Ming had this experience of not only being invaded, but being ruled by and taken over by these so-called barbarians. So this is really when the Great Wall amped up. Now the picture you see here by the Batai Sea is the eastern end of the Great Wall. The wall itself was mildly successful, and no, it can't be seen from space. Marco Polo did not mention it when he traveled there in the 13th century, and that makes sense, because the original wall from the Qin Dynasty had fallen into serious repair. Marco Polo went there during the Yuan Dynasty, and it's not like they're going to you know, keep themselves out, so to speak. At its peak, there were 25,000 watchtowers and it included living quarters and signal towers. The wall itself, about 1,500 miles long, and legend has it that one million men died constructing it. So we get to see some of the characteristics that epitomize the Ming. Many of them are similar to previous dynasties. 
bit of a difference is the missionaries. Christian missionaries begin to show up in China. Now, Christianity first reached China during the prosperous Ming Dynasty, and it's going to call for a different missionary strategy than had previously been used. Now, the Christian missionaries, in this case we're talking Jesuits, are going to need government permission to operate. So, the Jesuits targeted the Chinese elite, and Matteo Ricci, the man you see here, advocated for a top-down approach. Ricci tried to convince the elites that the original version of Confucianism was indeed compatible with Christianity. There was a popular form of Neo-Confucianism that was stressing that anyone could live a virtuous life via introspection, and Ricci insisted that was a clear distortion of the faith. You know, Ricci was invited to banquets where he would take part in philosophical debates. Now, he's a very smart individual. He had the ability to repeat long lists of information and repeat them backwards as well. So this is going to interest these Confucian scholars whose society and their positions within it are based on this knowledge and passage of exams. Now, some scholars and officials converted to the faith, and Jesuits were appreciated for some of their contributions, you know, mathematical, astronomical, and cartographical skills and knowledge. We see that Chinese artists would experiment with European techniques for landscape painting, while Ming astronomers were indeed impressed with telescopes and the ability of Europeans to predict eclipses. You know, Ricci even provided a world map that gave context as to where his people, the so-called barbarians, were located. In about 250 years, the missionaries gained about 200 to 300,000 converts. But despite all of this, that is definitely not mass conversions. You know, these missionaries didn't offer much that the Chinese felt they needed. It was very unappealing as an all-or-nothing religion, and there was a feeling that this Christianity would call for a rejection of much of Chinese culture. Ricci did try to emphasize the moral and ethical ideals of the faith instead of the faith itself, but, but it was to no avail. He even stopped talking about the suffering and death of Jesus when he realized that this was kind of a sore point for many Chinese scholars. By the end of the 1700s, the Jesuits are forced to alter their strategy due to orders from the Pope. Now, as it stands, you know, Ricci does gain access to the Forbidden City, the home of the Chinese emperor in Beijing, at a time when the Ming emperor began to seclude himself from public life. Due to the insistence on the silver tax system, inflation is going to occur, and the economy will be more vulnerable to foreign concerns, such as when the global supply of silver will start dropping off after 1620. It's not going to do very well for your silver-only tax policy. The emperor will begin to neglect his duties and award prestigious positions based on nepotism rather than competence and talent. So we start out the dynasty with more of a reverence for the exams and talent, and now it's kind of fading away. Internal rebellions became a consistent occurrence, and northern invaders from what's now Manchuria or the Manchu, will overthrow the dynasty in 1644, and they'll begin the Qing dynasty. So the Manchu or Qing dynasty will definitely increase the empire. This is actually the last Chinese dynasty that we see occurring in, in Chinese history. Now to back up ever so slightly, in the 1590s, the Ming called upon the Manchu to resist a Japanese invasion. And from their homeland in Manchuria, the Manchu were part of this tribute network, another continuity, and they emulated the Chinese bureaucracy while keeping their own language and traditions. In response, the Manchu fighters rallied behind a leader who led what they called the Qing Dynasty. 
and five decades later, prominent Mongol and Ming generals switched their allegiance to the Manchu because the Ming influence is going down. It's declining. In 1644, one of the rebel armies stormed the capital of Beijing and took control of the empire. First it was the Mongols, now it's the Manchu. Once again, northern bar barbarians are ruling over China. The Qing were able to expand their homelands into China and Central Asia, and they built a land-based empire that was twice the size of their main predecessors. It covered a little over 10% of the surface area of the planet, and to this day it remains the fourth largest empire in world history. Now, to justify their right to use the Mandate of Heaven, the Qing maintained the examination system, and they stressed the importance of Confucianism. We're, we're keeping some continuities. Uh, for example, Emperor Kang Shi, who you see here, oversaw a population boom with the planting of American crops like potatoes and maize in areas that were previously marginal for agriculture. So the population is going to surpass 400 million by 1800, and for comparison, the U.S. population, about 330 million as of 2020. Agriculture and the land were viewed as sources of wealth according to Confucianism, so this success was viewed as validation of their respect for traditions. Now the next emperor, after Kang Shi, will take Confucian emphasis on empiricism further when he orders a thorough census of all land holdings. Tax collection will become more efficient, and the tax burden was spread among rich and poor alike, mainly due to the data in what amounted to an 800,000 page encyclopedia. I mean, you're talking tax collection, that is a very intricate series of records. The emperors even used the painting of imperial portraits to legitimize their rule. Often, these portraits would be hung in the walls of the Forbidden City, and they were part of funeral rites. Uh, for example, Kan Shi had portraits of himself that were surrounded by books, or he was reading books to emphasize his taste for formal learning. If he was viewed as a Confucian scholar, he would earn the approval of elites and gain this mandate of heaven. Now, despite their efforts to demonstrate their legitimacy, the Manchu continued to adhere to some of their cultural traditions. They continued to speak Manchu, and they personally practiced Tibetan Buddhism, which has more in common with their Central Asian subjects as opposed to their ethnic Han Chinese subjects. And even the term Han Chinese distinguishes between the Manchu and the ethnic Chinese, and marriage between the two was strictly forbidden. The exception to the desire not to impose cultural laws. All right, so by and large, the Han could keep their culture, except that it was decreed that all men must wear their hair in the style you see here. The Q, this is pronounced Q hairstyle, so you have a single braid in the back, complemented by a shaved forehead. So we can clearly see as we look at the Ming leading into the Qing land-based empire. Number of continuities to connect them to previous Chinese dynasties, but especially with the Qing. In certain areas, they're forging ahead with their own path. 